You're listening to Jay's Analysis, integrating film, philosophy, geopolitics, literature, history, economics, intrigue, and espionage, only at jaysanalysis.com. And now, Jay's Analysis Podcast, with your host, Jay Dyer. In this episode of Jay's Analysis, I invited Dr. Joseph P. Farrell, a friend of mine that I've known for several years now, to come back on to discuss his book, The Third Way. I got a hold of his book last year and really enjoyed it. I thought it was a great complement to the series that I've been doing on Tragedy and Hope by Dr. Carol Quigley. In this interview, we cover the tie-ins, the connections, the backdoor shadow state dealings, in the first hour and in the second hour we cover more speculative esoteric subjects like what CERN might be a cover for. So I want to thank ACR Alternate Current Radio Network for hosting this show. Go to ACR's page and check out what's going on there. A lot of good shows, a lot of good podcasts. Also check out 21st Century Wire where I write as well as Sean Helton, Patrick Henningsen and many other excellent writers dealing with a lot of geopolitics and news. Definitely want to check out 21st Century Wire and the Sunday Wire radio show. And now my interview with Dr. Joseph P. Farrell on The Third Way. Welcome. You're listening to Jay's Analysis. Dr. Joseph P. Farrell joins me again. I had the honor and pleasure of meeting Dr. Farrell in person last year at the Secret Space Program Conference in Texas. And at that time, I was able to get a hold of his latest book, the Third Way, The Nazi International and the European Union and Corporate Fascism. And this is a really good book, and I thought it would be very timely, given the fact that I'm three lectures deep into Quigley and his monumental tome, Tragedy and Hope, and much tie-in, much similarity and congruence, might we say convergence, mm. <laughs> <laughs> since convergence is an appropriate term for this kind of plan. And... <clears throat> So why don't you tell us maybe first, Dr. Farrell, what prompted this book given the other books? Well, this book, some of the research that is in the third way I'd actually uncovered way back when I did uh, Reich of the Black Sun and then um, Nazi International. So I had some of that research for years, and I didn't, I didn't think that putting it all into Nazi International, you know, would be too much for people to really absorb. And I thought there was more to the story, too, than what I had uncovered back then. So I just kind of tabled it and decided, you know, if I found out more information about some of this stuff, I'd go ahead and do uh, another book on it. And that, in fact, happened, and, and I did The Third Way. All right, let's talk about what is The Third Way. I mean, we're, we're going to get, I'm sure, pretty deep, but what do you mean by this? Well, The Third Way is actually a term... If you go back to the Nazi International book, uh, it's a term that was used by people like Juan Perón. Uh, Muammar Gaddafi referred to this as well in some of his writings uh, back in his terrorist phase. That basically refers to the idea that with two power blocks, communism and Western finance capitalism, you had to have, create a, a third block in between these two, for them, extremes, mm. as a kind of mediating synthesis of the two, and hence you get National Socialism. And this, in fact, if you look at the, the documents I put in the third way, this is, in fact, particularly the document called the Madrid Circular, this is basically what they're advocating. And it's very interesting to me that Perón really is the first one to articulate this as a kind of uh, geopolitical philosophy. And he's doing this at the time, of course, that he's taking in all these Nazis in Argentina. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is interesting because we tend to think of, uh, you know, dialectics and either or. And I remember a few mm -hmm. years ago I was looking at what's public at the CFR archives and I wrote an article about how the uh, OSS was involved in training Mao's guerrillas. Yes. And if you look at the CFR archives, they discuss a kind of split back in the 40s between a kind of Dulles uh, 
pro-Nazi CIA faction of the yes. CFR, and then you had this kind of Alger Hiss pro-Soviet convergence idea. So right. you're saying that, well, it's not just Hiss and members of the CFR. This is kind of a, a, a shared idea, really, that's going on in the background, perhaps by bigger players. Yes, and it's very interesting to me that you bring up the CRR, CFR archives and their actual collaboration with the Maoists in China, because at the very end of the third way, I put in a chapter about Senator McCarthy, because uh, it has always fascinated me. I'm from South Dakota, you know, and, and Senator Munt, the one of the Republican senators that voted not to censure uh, Joseph McCarthy in that famous censure vote, was still a sitting senator when I was a little boy. I remember him very well, and you didn't have you didn't have the McCarthy as the icon of all that's evil in the world, you know, that you, you get in certain quarters. So I put this chapter in the third way because it's always fascinated me that at that time in American history, you had all of these congressional committees, and they're all looking at various aspects of penetration of the federal government. Mm -hmm. McCarthy being the most famous example, but uh, House on American Activities Committee, uh, the Kefauver Committee with the Mafia, mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, you have that dirty deal <laughs> that Alan Dulles made with General Galen and you exactly. know, yeah, rolling right. the whole Nazi <laughs> You know, intelligence apparatus into the into the CIA, right. and it's always struck me that there's never been a comprehensive history of why is it that all of these committees <laughs> are going on at the same time, mm -hmm. and what may really be the case. And I think you fingered it right there. Is that there's some sort of uh, background factional infighting going on between this pro-Soviet consolidation CFR crowd and mm. the Alan Dulles, Sullivan and Cromwell, you know, he and his brother crowd in the State Department and, and the CIA. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I put it in there just to kind of see if people would follow that up, you know, provide a few clues. And so far, no one has. But I think it's I think it's a legitimate point because. Uh, Senator McCarthy, of course, uh, fingered very quickly in, in his government operations subcommittee the whole Institute of Pacific Relations, yes. which was, of course, staffed by a lot of CFR people. You and had, Rockefellers, right. And the Rockefeller Foundations and so on. The Reese Committee, another famous uh, committee that I examine in, in the Common Core book that's coming out, dealing with the foundations and the philosophy that they're trying to sponsor in American education. So... You've got all of this stuff going on, and I think it, I think what we really need is kind of a scholarly look at that period of American history and all all these committees, you know, which I don't think anybody's done, to my knowledge. Let's but, talk about the origin of the EU. The EU has obviously been big in the news given Brexit. I did hear some of your recent discussions of Brexit and what it means and signifies. And if we look at the EU, of course, uh, this goes back to ideas certainly prior to the 40s, but at least a comprehensive right. presentation mm -hmm. at Bilderberg in the 40s with the idea of let's put together a European common market. Right. Now, you talk about the uh, European common market early on in the book, around page 40, 41, mm -hmm. and you talk about Russia and Middle Europa. And mm -hmm. now, what is this apocalyptic struggle against the Slavs? How does that play into this? Well, there's a lot going on here with the European Union. You know, if you if you look at it in a certain way, this has been going on ever since the collapse of, of the Western Roman Empire. But mm -hmm. in more modern times, you had Napoleon Bonaparte, of course, trying to create his continental system. You certainly had, as I go into in the third way, you had as German war aims shortly after World War I broke out, the idea that they were going to try, if they won the war, to create this European common market and dominate Central Europe and, and expand eastward. In the Nazi version, you have this tied, of course, with the idea of two things, the Nazi expansion to the east to acquire Lebensraum. But it's also very interesting to me that in 1942, there, and I put the, a picture of the cover of this, uh, the front page title piece of, of this particular book that was published in Berlin. It was a study that was sponsored by the Reichsbank uh, under the presidency of, of uh, Walter Funk, the German 
economics minister, and in conjunction and with the sponsorship of I.G. Farben. Yes. So they got all these academics together to look at how they were going to set up a, a European common market. And there's two things that emerged in their studies that actually several, that you can look at this document and see the duplication almost exactly in, in detail in the current structure of the EU. But I want to focus on, on three things in particular that, that they wanted to do. The first was when Italy and Germany signed the, the Axis Pact, they set up a committee of lawyers, essentially, to amalgamate German and Italian law specifically and particularly with respect to patent law, mm -hmm. all right? So in other words, this is the first thing that they, they wanted to do is harmonize law. But, well, how do you do that with such very different cultures and histories and so on? So mm -hmm. the second thing that the Nazis recommended, this, this to me is the clincher right here. They wanted to create a regulatory bureaucracy of essentially unelected commissars or commissioners as they're called in Europe now that would regulate and bypass through regulation bypass sitting national legislatures and simply disseminate regulations that everybody had to obey the third thing they want to do they wanted to do was they wanted to set up an exchange rate mechanism for all European currencies and tie them to a fixed rate of, of fluctuation, a peg, to the Reichsmark. Well, lo and behold, you know, after German reunification, thank you, Helmut Kohl, uh, we get the phenomenon, it was actually before him, but it really kind of took off under German reunification. They set up what was called an exchange rate mechanism, and this was a mechanism that existed before the current euro, where the currencies essentially of middle Europa, again, were all pegged to the German Deutschmark. Right. So that you had the, the Danish kroner, you had the Dutch guilder, the Austrian shilling, and so on. They were all coupled to the Deutschmark and allowed to fluctuate, but only within certain narrow bands. And when they got outside those bands, the Bundesbank, the German central bank, had to step in and bring those currencies back into those, those regions and stabilize the currency. It got interesting when France entered that arrangement uh, under Cole and Valéry Giscard d'Escang, and essentially what that did was, was France basically capitulated, and you had, you had financial and economic policy being made in Germany through the Bundesbank. When that didn't work, they set up the EU, and what did they do? They went to the Nazi plan of 1942. Well, this is so. what, yeah, this is the next <laughs> question I had was that Quigley presents yeah. different continental block models right. by both the Axis and the Allied powers. Now, right. Quigley says that after World War I, the reparations were such that Germany was more or less uh, basically backed into a corner yes. and that the erection of the dollar-based Bretton Woods system mm -hmm. was intended as a kind of monetary excommunication of Germany, mm -hmm. especially through free trade. Now, what's interesting right. is that so both models include free trade and include continental blocks uh -huh. and are a form of Reich, but be it the uh, Axis Atlantis or, or uh -huh. excuse me, the, the, the Axis powers or the uh, Western Atlantis powers. So what I'm wondering right. is, <clears throat> uh, if now both of these plans include this continental block, right? how do you see, is it because we have these, uh, say, the beginning of the BIS with uh, the, the Nazi banker running the BIS at the beginning? Uh -huh. uh, is, is, what's going on here? Well, I think that that's a really good question. I think what you're looking at is, again, more uh, common cause over the mid, uh, short to mid term by two blocks or, or deep state elites, the, the German, you know, Nazi Reich elite, mm -hmm. uh, the big corporations, you know, in Germany that essentially run uh, run their corporations as cartels. And we've seen a recent example of this with, with Bayer trying to take over Monsanto in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this has always been kind of the German model of, of big corporate industrial capitalism. So it's, it's very powerful, in other words, in the German deep state. Mm -hmm. And by the, by the same token, if you look at the arrangements that corporations have in, in 
Imperial Germany. This carries on into the Weimar Republic throughout uh, the Third Reich and then becomes part of German policy in West Germany. You have this very tight relationship between the state and the corporations, and all three are involved even at the board level in corporations, particularly the labor unions, in coordinating everything. So Mm -hmm. German industry is very, very heavily subsidized by the government and vice versa. Right. I think what you have, therefore, Jay, is you have the Sullivan and Cromwell crowd, Averill Harriman, John J. McCloy, and all of these people, who look at this this block in Europe and they realize they've got to do two things. They've got to dominate it. You know, let's not have an, a, another world war because of this tiny little country with this enormous industrial plant. Um, you, to, it's easier to do that by locking it into an arrangement where it surrenders some of its sovereignty to a regional block, which the United mm-hmm. States, in their thinking, can dominate. And this, I think, was ultimately the reasoning behind NATO. Zbigniew Brzezinski admits as much in, in the grand chessboard. Right. Yeah. But on the, on the Nazi side, they're looking mm-hmm. at it from completely a different point of view, because for them, this is a way to establish German domination in Europe without having to fight a war, mm-hmm. to do it to do it through these types of regulation institutions, to do it through amalgamation of law, to do it Mm -hmm. through the coupling of the currency to the German economy, which you certainly see in Europe today. So you've got both of these things, I think, working in the background, and they're not always going to be... they're not always going to be working together, and I think we see that happening now. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I think Mer- Merkel is kind of the last gasp of the Atlanticists. There's there's growing revolt in in yeah. Europe and in Germany, and particularly Middle Europa. You know, Germany and Austria, Hungary, essentially, uh, to to get themselves out from underneath this American influence and, and unipolarism. I think this is the reason that they're pushing so hard for a regional block military, you know, to to basically create a, a paper NATO, and it's really going to be the Europeans running the military, meaning France and Germany. So, yeah, I think I think that's an excellent question. For me, it's an example of factional infighting. That's, okay. that's the bottom line. Let's <clears throat> get your comment on this. Quigley's thesis of Hitler is a little muddled at times because he mm-hmm. goes into depth discussing the industrialists funding Hitler. Uh, mm-hmm. And he also has this really curious section about the Cliveden set in London, particularly the Astors and you know, right. roundtable round groups, that they were uh, very pro-Hitler. Now, mm-hmm. this is mainstream news now, of course, that members of the British aristocracy were, were pro-Hitler. But Quigley paints it as a, a time where right before the war, the Cliveden set was pro-Hitler, but they were also running news to hype up the war. With mm-hmm. it. So, mm-hmm. in your opinion, what level of um, coordination and cooperation do we see in the background of the uh, British aristocracy, or this faction of the British aristocracy, mm-hmm. at least, uh, with with pro Hitlerism and so forth? Or was this a ruse? Uh, you know, we think of Hesse's flight mm-hmm. uh, to Scotland and how uh, you know some have posed the thesis that perhaps Hesse was actually a British mole. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, Quigley talks about members of uh, Hitler's cabinet regularly gallivanting with the Cliveden set. Yes. <laughs> sipping yes. champagne and so forth. Well, Joachim von Ribbentrop, you know, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> was that's certainly one of them. Um, I, that's, that's a very interesting and it's a very delicate question. And I have to be honest, I don't go into that question in the third way. Um, maybe someday I'll get around to writing a book about it. I don't know, but... Off the top of my head, my my thought about that relationship between you know the Cliveden set, Salisbury Group, all of that mm. stuff going on in Great Britain, has always been yes, they're 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 backing Hitler, but for the very simple reason that he is he is going to revivify the German economy. They've pumped lots of money into it, and nothing's happening because the Germans can't come up with a stable government. They've got the communists. They're worried about that and, and nationalization of industry and loss of all their investments. So they're doing that, I think, simply to get that money flow going again and getting the economies off the ground. You know, But the, the deeper question here is, did they do this and did they hype up the war 
to for some other long term agenda. Right. And I think the answer there is yes, and it's the answer that that is kind of implied in the research of Anthony Sutton. Yes. You have with the Bolshevik uh, state in in Russia, you have a state that number one has turned its its back basically on any sort of connection with with Western values other than Marxism, and and what it's embodying there is not a really very good version of it in some respects. But you also have a at that time you have the 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 communist international the idea that the soviet union is is going to sweep into europe with its massive industrialization that the bolsheviks began and i think part of this is the age old british atlanticist fear of a major asian bloc yes dominating the world and the only country i mean by far, that was in a position militarily, economically, and geopolitically to deal with Russia was Germany. Right. Uh, yeah. You know, the Russians surrendered in World War One. It was it was just a bad war from beginning yeah. to end yeah. for them. And in World War Two, we know, you know, that that the Wehrmacht went all the way to Stalingrad and considerably. Let me, let me ask you this because it seems that. Quigley poses this, and this is kind of what we get out of the great game, and even right. Friedman at Stratfor has talked about how yes. the, the 20th century politics could be summed up in basically making sure that there's no alliance between Germany and Russia, Germany and, Russia. Yeah. and then the Thank subsequent you know. weakening of those countries right. through the exportation of Bolshevism uh, by what Sutton argues, or uh, perhaps the, the weakening of Russia right. uh, by this uh, cabal in the background. Uh, excuse me, the weakening of Germany by the cabal in the background that's pro-Hitler, perhaps, who right. wanted a war to weaken them. And <clears throat> just a little side note, Quigley uh, says, argues that that was what happened to Italy. He says yes. that the uh, British intelligence, I believe he says, flew... Um, no, excuse me, he's talking about Spain. He says that British intelligence flew Franco into Spain. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and that the uh, British thought that this would be a good way to weaken uh, to, to weaken Spain, if I recall. I'm, I may be mm -hmm. fuzzy on that, but I believe, I believe that's what he says. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it, yeah, I, I don't recall exactly what he says there either myself, but I do think that, that this thesis that the, the deeper agenda that you had within the Clydeson set and their uh, American cousins... Uh, to weaken both Russia and Germany by a huge war is part of the game plan. Yeah. I don't think that they predicted at all the extent to which uh, Germany was successfully able to prosecute that war all the way up, you know, to about the midpoint of, of Operation Barbarossa. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think they were expecting the, the quick collapse of France. I certainly don't think they were expecting the Germans to invade Norway and, you know, all the other things that they did. Um, that was the surprise. And, and, you know, at that point, they have to get the United States into the war because, you know, they realize that neither England nor Russia on their own are going to be able to prosecute this to the end. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's underestimating the Russians. I think they were fully capable, but that was their reasoning. So, yeah, I think there's deeper agendas here. And this third way idea mm -hmm. is really, in a certain sense, if you look at the, the timing of the Nazi documents that I put in the third way, it's almost as if they're waking up to that realization at, at some point during the war because they're starting to plan. They see, oh, we've been duped, you know. Yeah. Uh, we, we've got a nut in charge of the country, and, you know, it's <laughs> turning into military disaster. So, yeah, I think they start coming up with these plans. Well, we're going to play the game with them. Mm -hmm. And I think you see in, in the way that they prosecuted things at the end of the war and after the war with the deals with American intelligence to keep the the German intelligence network in place with the deals that I definitely think they made to move all that loot into the Western banking system with a you know a marker that it's going to come due at some point. Mm -hmm. um, I think all of this is part of their long-term game plan. So yeah, absolutely. I think I think you're correct here. Well, I, f I did find it. It's uh, 597. He says, so one of the chief figures in the conspiracy in England was Douglas Gerald, a well-known editor who revealed in some detail in his autobiography that Major Hugh Pollard, 
flew to the Canary Islands in order to transport Franco by plane to Morocco. Yeah. So once again, we yeah. see British intelligence in the background. Yeah. Uh, with the fascists, I thought I thought Britain stood for freedom and democracy. What is well, yeah, they stand for freedom and do democracy for themselves, not every, <laughs> not everybody else. Hence Brexit, right? <laughs> Hence Brexit. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, well, I like that point you made that uh, what could be in the background is certain business interests in sure. you know that that don't uh, like bureaucratic EU regulation. That makes that seems to make right. sense. Yeah. But back to the the third way. Now, <clears throat> if you Google third way and convergence and all this stuff, you'll get Wikipedia in these articles, then you'll see uh, Tony Blair and Bill Clinton as representatives <laughs> shaking hands. You get BBC articles about about this. And that's interesting because uh, that would be relatively appropriate given that Quigley mm -hmm. was uh, Clinton's mentor. And mm -hmm. there is an entire chapter in Tragedy and Hope. Uh, he doesn't explicitly use the term, but he does say that the government of the coming era, the future, uh -huh. uh, the hope period that he's talking about, minus the tragedy, the coming hope period will be one of managerial rule by experts, bureaucrats, uh -huh. total social, socialist, technocratic control. Uh -huh. Now, Quigley has an entire chapter on that. So that is exactly what you're talking about with yeah. the third way. Yeah, and and... This is this is exactly what the Nazi plan was that they detailed in 1942. It was essentially ruled by by technocrats, by managers, by lawyers, mm -hmm. by commissars, and so on and so forth. But you know, the really interesting thing to me here is, okay, guys, we've had for about 30 years now you globalists running things. We've got your free trade agreements, we've got all of these blocks going on, and Mr. Rockefeller thinks it's a wonderful idea that the world be run by altruistic bankers like himself. Well, what a wonderful track record that they have of bringing peace and prosperity to the world so far. <laughs> you know, nobody nobody uh, other that I can think of, other than maybe Mr. Putin and, and the Prime Minister of Hungary, has been challenging this globalist dogma that we're going to be able to get along in a corporately run multicultural world. And the Brits have finally had it. And I think this is interesting because if you look at Britain now reacting to the EU, I have to wonder, Jay, if maybe they're not only reacting out of pure cultural self-interest or even business interest. I mean, my word, how can you run a business with commissioners in Brussels mandating the size and curvature of bananas? You know, nutty stuff like this. You can't do it. And the other thing I, I have to wonder is, is there some awareness in, in the British deep state that what they're looking at in Europe is precisely this Nazi plan come to fruition and they're cutting their losses and getting out of it now. Well, <clears throat> I did a whole chapter in my book, and, and there's a piece at my website analyzing the latest Bond installment mm -hmm. where you had that exact storyline. Now, the mm -hmm. storyline centers around what they call the Nine Eyes security system, which is this kind of rough yep. NSA, GCHQ type thing, mm -hmm. uh, but could roughly be also applied to the political system of the European Union. And what happens? Well, if you don't go along, you get bombed by Spectre, and Spectre, <laughs> and Spectre's yeah. going, and that gets you in line, and then, of course, Spectre's in the background uh, having basically finagled their way into British intelligence uh, and, yep. and running this big uh, you know, tech surveillance grid. And it's interesting. Let, let me comment on just that aspect of things, because I think you're right. You look at both versions of Spectre in the James Bond films, the recent one with Daniel Craig and, and Christopher Waltz playing the bad guy, and the earlier one with Donald Pleasance uh, and some of the other actors that they got to play, you know, Ernst Stavro Blofeld. Well, mm -hmm. why is why is the head of Spectre always a German you know, <laughs> or an Austrian in, in Christopher Waltz's case? Mm -hmm. and, and again, you know, I think Ian Fleming knows something and he's telling everybody something. And the British elite know that something, too. And they don't want to play ball with it anymore because they've been losing, you know, two world wars. The empire is no more. Uh, they're kind of a, a, a province off, off of Europe, and they want to get back in the global game. And, and there's no other way for them to do that than, than to cut loose of, of Brussels. And well, Berlin. like you said, which that's basically having to listen to 
Washington secondhand. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So I think I think they're I, I think you know from from their point of view they've done the correct thing culturally, politically, economically, financially, uh, and I think I think we're going to see. We're seeing the reaction on Europe right now. I mean, Merkel. I saw her after after the Brexit vote, and she just looked miserable. I mean, she looked more miserable than she normally does, and she could barely speak above a whisper. Yeah. So now, you know, they're they're rolling out the European super state big time. Um, so you know, this is this is again Berlin basically calling the shots, and and. Sooner or later, I hate to tell everybody, this is going to rear its head and it's going to bite the USA too. And uh, we're seeing it already happen. So, yeah, I think I think third way here is exactly what's happening in Europe. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind, and there's no doubt in my mind that behind the scenes you have basically an unreconstructed fascist philosophy driving all of it. Well, let me ask you this, because, so, w would it be more appropriate, I'm not disagreeing with your thesis i'm just wondering is it is it just is it just fabian or is it do you see it as a top-down fascist model and not a fabian model i think it's a little bit of both but in the final analysis you know the fact of the matter is is that policy and economic and military decisions are going to be driven by germany and and that for one very simple reason if you look at the size of the German economy, right, it's number right. four or five in the world, and it's on a population base of, you know, what, 70 or 80 million people in a, a country the size of Oregon, you know. Mm -hmm. um, this is, you know, to my mind, this is the, the old strategic problem of the Kaiser with a vengeance. You know, you've got this little powerhouse in the center of Europe, and it's going to drag everybody along one way or the other. And, and so long as you've got that kind of mentality in Germany, and you've got Equally in France, you've got, you know, the uh, old Ecole d'Etat in France training all these big state bureaucrats to run all of this stuff for France and now Europe. The mentality is there that it's mostly top down. Um, and you're seeing the pushback to this where the socialism in southern Europe has always been kind of bottom up. Mm hmm you're getting that pushback in Italy now in a major way. It's It's been there in Greece, and the poor Greeks, you know, can't really do anything about it because they're not powerful enough. You've got the same thing in Spain. So, you know, I think they're clamping down this big super state in a rush to make sure nobody else is able to leave. And um, mm -hmm. it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. Are we looking at a an attempt to... Well, I like that you, you, you talk about shocked and Montague Norman, and that ties mm -hmm. in uh, very intimately with the discussions that Quigley has. Yep. Uh, precisely because the chief member states of the Bank for National Settlements were the big Western powers, and yep. the top dog at that time uh, with the New York Federal Reserve was, of course, the Bank of England and Montague Norman. Right. And so <clears throat> what economically, what are we looking at here with... In other words, why are we on the dollar-based system? Is it simply because the the UK economy was too weak uh, after the wars to really become a powerhouse and just the natural right. resources of the U.S. functioned as the means by which to utilize uh, basically America's wealth and resources as the engine of the Atlantis' economic powerhouse? Yeah, they had to because you've got you've got again from from the traditional British and American geopolitical Atlanticist perspective, you've got this powerhouse in Russia that's now injected itself into half of Europe and stayed there. You also have a population base, therefore, in the Soviet Union that is able to sustain a, globe, a major global effort. You've got the industrial base. You've got the technological base. So Great Britain cannot do it on its own. And therefore, you do have to, you do have to move things to a dollar reserve status. But, you know, Britain, Britain, I think, Jay, in all honesty, when you're talking about these huge long-term historical movements in in the 20th century Britain really did not come out of World War one in good shape I mean That's they had sense, right yeah they they had just you know they had basically laid siege to the central powers for four years and gotten nowhere mm -hmm. and spent you know rivers of blood and and 
immense amounts of treasure and indebted themselves to the United States and then it make the matter worse by imposing reparations on Germany that the Germans can't possibly pay. So I think, I think the Bretton Woods thing is all kind of a reaction in part to the bitter experience of World War I and realizing they can't do that again. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, it's also, I think, a, a kind of interesting scheme to make the United States bear the burden mm -hmm. now of the military effort yes, of, of right. containment. Right. So would you, we are looking at uh, a Mackinder style land power, sea power battle here? Yeah, I think so. Yes, I do. And that's what that's what has them so upset, you know, to extend this even more from from World War Two into the into modern times. I think this is what has them so upset about the emergence of China's plans for the Silk Road and all of that infrastructure mm -hmm. that they want to develop in Central Asia and so on in conjunction with Russia. They are terrified of that block. And the United States doesn't appear to be able to handle any of this now. So Britain's cutting itself in loose, in my opinion, for yet another reason. I think they're going to play the soft power card, and they're going to play it very well. They're going to revivify the Commonwealth. Um, it was amazing to me, almost hours after the Brexit vote was done, and it was clear that, that the vote had been to leave, Australia and New Zealand are lining up to cut some deals. So, you know, there's the Commonwealth in action, and that would be a global block, and it would yep. be a, it would be a counterpoise both to Berlin and a counterpoise to Washington. Mm -hmm. So I think they're, they've put themselves over the long term and into a very nice position. One of the more obscure things going in the background that you've written many books on is the secret technology, hidden physics, and so forth, in the background of the development right. of nuclear energy and so forth. And you talk about Iran and nuclear proliferation. Now, what's interesting is that, you know, in Iran... Uh, prior to the coup uh, of the CIA and MI6, mm -hmm. you already have, you know, British power, Anglo-American oil company, or Anglo-Iranian oil, right, uh, basically running Iran, mm -hmm. and then you have this coup. Uh, what does that signify in terms of, and why is this such a big deal is what I'm getting at? What, why? Well, the the post war coups of of um, the overthrow of King Farouk in Egypt mm -hmm. and the overthrow of Mossadegh in Iran mm -hmm. both I think in approximately the same time frame yeah. uh, fifty four fifty three somewhere in there um, Americans have it in their heads that this was all just the CIA doing this well the bad news is that the CIA's networks on the ground in those countries were Nazis. <laughs> Okay, in other words, it's it's that it's that post-war, what I've been calling Nazi international with with ties to German intelligence and all of that. These are the boots on the ground carrying out these coups for the CIA. Okay, so you have right there the injection. You're saying Operation Ajax, right? Yes, you're having the injection of these Nazi influences into those countries, and they're linking up with well, radical. Yeah. Radical Wahhabism, and that would, uh, as a tailored ideology, that would be perfect uh, in Iranian theology or, or oh, yeah, Iranian absolutely. mindset. And this is also, as you point out in your book, you know why you've got Hitler meeting with the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem and so forth. Right. So that and, so it's part of the ideology of you know the the anti-Zionist uh, perspective that would be popular yes. in Iran and amongst uh, Wahhabis, as you say. And the other thing we have to remember is that German business with Iran between the wars was was fairly substantial. That's they what were, I was going to ask about. Is, yeah. is, that, is that what we're getting to, the the nuclear aspect? You've got yes. a section where you talk about <laughs> the Shah and uh, Helmut Schmidt. Yeah. A lot of Iran's nuclear technology came from, from West Germany or Germany. Mm -hmm. A lot of Iraq's, for that matter, did. Uh, some of it from France. But the interesting thing, since you mentioned that, I, w I had an email mailed, emailed to me by a friend of mine in Germany about an article that just came out last week in Der Spiegel, mm -hmm. where German intelligence has identified Iranian firms attempting to purchase more nuclear and missile technology from Germany, which, of course, makes you wonder just what sort of nuclear technology the Germans really have. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so yeah, Iran is a player, but Germany is in the mix here once again because their businesses are so heavily penetrated in, in Iran. It's a lot of German and Russian technology that have gone into their nuclear program. And you know, if you if you read the third way carefully, one of the things I point out is that Germany has the complete fuel cycle. Mm -hmm. In other words, they could produce atomic bombs in a week if they wanted to. <laughs> you know, they probably have, in my opinion. So it's a, it, it is a de facto nuclear power, whether we want to admit it or not. And they have done this very carefully, as I pointed out in, in the book, by making these types of corporate arrangements with so-called pariah nations like Iran, mm -hmm. or South Africa a few decades ago, where they, they source out all the technology that their treaty obligations forbid them from having on German soil. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, this is the way they've dodged around this. They did this after World War I. They've done it after World War II. This is part of the consistent pattern. So, yeah, Iran is, is definitely in the mix here. Germany played a major role in negotiating that uh, deal with Iran uh, that Secretary Kerry uh, signed off on. So you you can't discount them. You know they are they are major movers and shakers on on the global stage, and I'm you know I'll, I'll be very blunt and honest and say I'm not terribly happy with, with the way they're moving and shaking on the world stage. Well, I tend I'm, I'm somewhat of a skeptic about Iran because I don't. Uh, I mean, certainly the apocalyptic ideology is strange, yeah. but uh, it seems to me that the the West, and you can find this even in fairly recent mainstream news reports in the last 10, 20 years. I think Lou Dobbs even did a, a uh -huh. report on uh, the U.S. Well, the International Atomic Energy yeah, Commission right. did as well, <laughs> Yeah, saying, you know, they're not making nuclear weapons. Um, again, the important thing to remember is whether or not they can close the fuel cycle. Mm -hmm. Once they close the fuel cycle, you know, it's just like Japan. They start producing plutonium and tons and tons of it, you know. And once you've said that, it, it doesn't take much uh, to see that that can very easily and quickly be converted into working nuclear weapons. You just have the parts in the warehouse, machine them, and assemble the bomb, and off you go. And the Iranians are smart enough to assemble a bomb without having to test one. So I think, I think there is a danger there in spite of what's been said, um, well, particularly, particularly given the ideology. I guess what I'm, yeah, what I'm thinking is some have, have written interesting theories or analyses that the proliferation of the AQCon nuke network and so forth, this is actually intended and part of uh, you know, yeah. CIA's strategy. There's not, there's not black markets of nukes out there that, that that's, mm -hmm. this is not happening outside of the purview of the, the Atlanticist establishment is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that to a certain extent. Um, the difficulty now is that you have this this theory that there are there are these mini nukes out there. Well, if you have the technology to produce those, how do you how do you really maintain your pro anti proliferation efforts? That's that's a huge concern. But by the same token, you know, I I look at it both ways too because you can't be Russia or China and really honest from their point of view, and be happy with a nuclear Iran. So I think, as well as the CIA, you're going to have certain pressure from those countries to prevent that from happening. Mm -hmm. Does this factionalism apply to aspects of, say, the Brzezinski model, which would is very critical of, say, Israel, uh, and would be pro-nuclear energy in Iran? Uh, like you mentioned with John Kerry, mm -hmm. uh, does this fit into that? Uh, how does that fit into this this model of uh, the international that you're speaking of? Because I get the impression that you know sometimes the 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 outworkings don't seem to make sense on the surface. You know why why is part of the State Department you know pro Iran and then at times not. You know, is, it, is that just that neocon war hawk faction that's that's vivid? I actually, that's an excellent question. And I have to admit, I haven't thought about that aspect of things. But if you if you want to go back to the to this long-term view that we're taking here, mm 
uh, I would view that as as yet another sign that you have some real deep factional fissures and cracks beginning to show themselves okay. in in the West. Right. Um, we're seeing this again. I think you see it very clearly in the Brexit vote, with with a certain segment of the of the British deep state, including the monarchy, for mm -hmm. crying out loud. You know that that was more or less in favor of leaving, and then you had the globalist faction. Mm -hmm. I think you're seeing that playing out in a number of areas and in a number of issues around the world, domestically in this country, and, and so on and so forth. I think these fissures are very deep, and I don't think, you know, since we're talking about it, go back to that period in the 50s when you had all of these congressional committees investigating penetration of the federal government, effectively. You've been listening to, or watching, my interview with Dr. Joseph P. Farrell, where we covered the subject of Tragedy and Hope by Dr. Carol Quigley and how it ties in with Dr. Farrell's book, The Third Way. You can check out Dr. Farrell's works at the Giza Death Star site, which is his blog and um, site for where you can purchase his books. And if you want to hear the rest of our interview, in the second half we cover what we think CERN might be, uh, given there's a really fascinating chapter in Dr. Farrell's Third Way book on what CERN might be a cover for, uh, as well as getting into other esoteric subjects. So you can subscribe at Jay's Analysis for $4.95 a month uh, or for $60 a year to get full lectures, talks, and interviews. Or, or you can check out a Dr. Farrell site where you can subscribe to his work as well. Thank you for listening.